This year's youngest competitor drives this year's most powerful machine. Big Red, his 1969 Z28 Camaro, has a 540 cubic inch Donovan aluminum big block that puts out 750 foot-pounds of torque and 800 horsepower. Hey guys, what's up? It's Sean, Autotopia LA, and today's a very, very, very special one, and I can't quite say how special it is. This is RJ. RJ's the owner and driver of the one and only, the legendary Big Red Camaro. We're gonna do this in a couple parts today. It's gonna be a little different than our traditional episode in that I feel like it's important to have you talk about your background as a driver, and then we'll have Mark step in and he'll talk about not only the build of the car, but the multiple variants of the build of the car. Sure. Kind of walk us through from somewhere around the age of about 15 years old going forward is your world as a driver. Well, Sean, first of all, thank you for coming out. Uh, you know, welcome to the Big Red shop. Thank uh, you. And this is Big Red, the, yep. the, what's, be, what's become a legend. And, Truly. Uh, going back to the mid 80s, uh, when me and my dad started it, it was really um, just an idea. You know, yeah. my dad wanted to make sure he was still spending time with me and I was just getting close to getting my driver's license. And he really saw it as an opportunity to kind of do something with me. The day I turned 16, you know, I got my driver's license. He put me in a Bob Bondurant driving school. And that was a lot of fun. It really got me kind of interested in racing and the idea right. of really performance driving and stuff. We had already started doing some drag racing, but we really wanted to get into road racing. For the, most of the, the classes, IMSA and SCCA, you really had to be 18. My dad, wanting to get going on it right away, found out about the La Carrera down in Mexico, where they'd basically let anyone run and let anything run. My dad gave me the opportunity to pick the kind of car I wanted, and by far my most favorite muscle car was the 69 Camaro. And so we did, we paired a car for the race, and actually in the first race, uh, I crashed. Actually, I was with another guy named Chris Kaufman. A steering heim had rattled loose. And at what speed did you crash? We're not sure, but the car was going over 200 at, on the straightaways, <laughs> and this was coming into a turn. And so it probably wasn't going quite that fast, but we were going over 150. We hit the, the mountain at the side of the road, pretty much totally destroyed the car. And on the look back, you know, we realized that the, the car, first of all, was going a lot faster than we thought it would go. And that we realized that the car had become half race and, and still half a street car. Yeah. And so we wanted to do a car that was really prepared properly and full race. We commissioned a Bill Osborne from Inland Chassis to build us a chassis that could fit the metal body of a 69 Camaro. One of the yeah. things uh, Bill Osborne did, though, was uh, set the engine back about 12 inches. And um, it's, <laughs> we were just doing it normally aspirated at the time. Yeah. But years later, we would put a supercharger on it. Yeah. And that setback gave us just enough room to put in a procharger. Gotcha. It's, it's, it's quite a great setup once you got it all in there. But we yeah. do have the basic two setups. One naturally aspirated with a 555, yeah. all aluminum uh, block and heads. The setup that we did the La Carrera in. And when we came back with this car and did the La Carrera, we won that time. Yeah. A lot of people were watching the car then. And they actually threw us out of the race. They claimed our car was too modified and that we couldn't run anymore. And uh, really it was insincere because so many of the cars were so highly modified. And it was really more that they wanted the Lamborghinis and Ferraris and they didn't want- They didn't want you coming yeah, out Yeah, this wasn't the everyone. type of car that was supposed to win. It was the reason my dad called it the original outlaw racer because we were outlawed from that race. Um, <laughs> but not to be deterred, my dad said, hey, you know, why don't we start that kind of race in the United States? He with some other guys started uh, the Silver State Classic that they still run to this day. Sure. We set a, a record uh, back then, averaging um, uh, like 198 miles an hour on the Silver State. That was yeah. like a 90 yeah, mile yeah. Uh, yeah. road course. From there, we, you know, we just kept wanting to sort of challenge ourselves and the car to do different things. Yeah. Years later, we'd go to a Texas mile. And for a long time, and I think we still do, we hold actually the naturally aspirated mile record at 218 miles an hour. <laughs> and um, we, were, we were proud of that for naturally aspirated, but all these other guys with uh, turbochargers and superchargers 
we're doing big, you know, over 250. We wanted to be a part of that, so that's when we put the uh, Pro Charger on it, put the bigger wing on it. Because of the Pro Charger, we had to put a much larger bubble hood on it. Yeah. All stuff that I wasn't crazy about because we really liked keeping it looking like a 69 Camaro. And so I mean, people arguably really a 69 connected. Camaro's got to be one of the most common cars that we see. I don't mean common in a bad manner, but you know what I mean? As Car far as in the common. pro touring and resto mod world, we right. see 69 Camaros a lot. Back in the day when we did this car, they weren't that common. Yeah. Now you go to the pro touring stuff and these shows, and then you see them a lot. That's where you see and a I lot And I think of them. that's yes. where, because people are really passionate about, you know, it's such a classic design. To somebody, it could sound like, like a psychotic. He's going out and going well over 250 miles per hour. But yeah, the, you're not just a guy that did a couple of Bondurant classes and then went and started driving. I mean, I was reading about you, yeah, RJ, yeah, and no, your history as a driver is... The original idea to get into racing uh, was not centered around Big Red, even though we started it back then. Yes. Um, part of the reason we started it back then is because my dad wanted to go racing right away. And, and didn't you were want too to young wait. at the time. Yeah, I didn't want to wait two years. Yeah. And once I became 18, then we started doing SCCA, we even did IMSA. I did GTU, GTO, and even uh, GTS. We did Road America, uh, Portland International Raceway, Sebring, great experience, a lot of fun. Whatever we did, I was always running the big front engine V8s. Eventually, I gave up doing a lot of the IMSA and SCACA, and this car had become very famous. So we just decided, hey, this is what we're gonna do from now on. So eventually right. we kind of came back around to the, the car we really began with. Yeah. Yeah, Mojave Magnum, we did 266. There we go. And that was the fastest the car has, has, has gone. Although, actually, I think technically it probably went faster at Bonneville. We're just not sure of it because Bonneville, they do an average. And we figured on one of the averages, I must have been doing over 270, but that's not official. We had a record at Bonneville at 258. It was uh, since been beat by another guy, but you know we did have it for a few years. Then you've done Pikes Peak, and didn't you? We did Pikes Peak. If I remember correctly, 1108. 1108. Very, very you were proud what of that. first or second in class? Something. No, like? no, no. We were actually fourth in class. Fourth in class. The second and third guy said it was very unfair that the lead guy was four wheel drive, and he really shouldn't have been in our class. But you know, most guys that are doing Pikes Peak, they're really purpose building the car for that race. We don't do that. We modify it to get it as best as we can for that event but we're always with, with our car, so. It's since, not like there's not four the different perfect, big reds. Yeah, no, there's not. Actually, people have accused us of that. I'll saying bet they that, that, you know, there must be more of these cars. So I would imagine. cornering Mark and saying, Mark, come on now, tell us the truth, tell yeah, us the truth. Yeah. We go, no, it's really not. They think, yeah. we're, think we're lying. As you can see, you're here at the shop. We, we don't have more of them. This would not be the ideal car for running Pikes Peak. But, you know, for us, we want to be able to say, we ran Pikes Peak in Big Red. The and same car that did the Mojave Mile exactly, and did Bonneville right, right. and did so all for the me different... It's, yeah, if it's not perfect for that class, that's okay. And that's something we often have to deal with. You know, when they saw the car, the guys that were really familiar with the race said, hey, this car won't break 13 minutes. So sure enough, all I wanted to do was break 13 minutes. Just to tick over And by 11. the end, we did 11.08. And I think if I could have had more time on it, I probably could break 11. Yeah, yeah. Hey guys, so now we're gonna move on from talking with RJ. Over to Mark, you've been with the family, with the car for 30 years, decades. I work under Dave. Anything that's gotta be fabricated on the car, it's Dave. I'm pretty much the guy that pulls motors, does motors. So you know the car inside out. Inside out. But let's go ground up, like it's- It's a full tube chassis car. The front suspension was built by Bill Osborne, who, who built the car. And the guy was a genius. It's based after probably a mid or early 80s Trans Am chassis. It originally had a three link in the car. Right now it has a four link in it and coilovers. I mean, everybody says, oh, it's a NASCAR with a Camaro body on it. Yeah, kinda. It's also a Trans Am car with a Camaro body on it. Got it. it. It's got stock four pans in it, it's got a stock dash in it, and parts of the stock firewall are in it. It's a race car with a stock Steel yeah, body, yeah, yeah, 1969 yeah, yeah. Camaro body. Up. By the way, you know, there's people watching right now that just went, did he really just beat on Big Red? And it's oh, like, well, I, you guys have beat on it a lot yeah, harder yeah, than yeah, that, yeah, man. We, we, <laughs> it looks pretty. Well, we burned it to the ground, getting ready for Pikes Peak in I 16. Know, I know. Redid it again, and that's the last time it's been massaged. Yeah. You know? So we take a lot of pride in how pretty it is. It really is. But we're not afraid to use it. Pike Peak and Bonneville were brutal on this car oh, as, God, as far as imagine. the beauty. Because Pike Pike's Peak, the uh, material, the granite, like that's on the roadway and stuff, yeah. just blasted. I mean, just beat powder coat to bare metal. So it's been fully repainted since then? No. Really? That's it. 
Look at the back fenders. Look at behind the front tire. Okay. Oh yeah, and the door. And yeah, it's, it's got its scars. Let's pop the hood. Is Thing. it a fiberglass hood? This is a fiberglass hood and mm -hmm. a carbon fiber deck lid, and that's the only that's the only part steel part. Metal. Yep. Mm -hmm. Man, All metal. RJ was mentioning that the engine set back 12 inches, something like that. I don't ever measure in inches. <laughs> it's not where it was originally. And it's way back. And it's right? back there a bit. <laughs> you know. Bitching to see the framework under here, the suspension. And RJ was also saying that although you guys do the different types of racing you do, the bulk of the car stays the same. So for Bonneville, we will change the upper arms. You know, when we run the Pro Charge setup, which is Bonneville or our straight line stuff with a Pro Charger, the sway bar is up on top of the frame chassis right now. It will lower underneath. We have three different rear end housings. We have what I call a light, a medium, and a heavy housing as far as the wall thickness goes. We put about 350 pounds of lead on the rear axle for Bonneville, and we saw on the camera the tubes were flexing. So we went and we had a super duty Wazoo housing built that doesn't flex anymore. Is that anymore. a technical term, the Wazoo? Wazoo. <laughs> I, it's one of mine, you know, the double Wazoo. Yeah. In our straight line and land speed stuff, we run a Rossler 4L80 trans. I guarantee you there's viewers that think like, oh no, there's no way, there's multiple versions of no, that we, car. We hear that every show the I've time, taken this thing to for the last yeah. five years is how many of these do you really have? Yeah. One. You know, you ought to see my part shelf. We run uh, 31 spline axles on road racing stuff. When we go big time with the Pro Charger, we'll run a strange nodular case with 35 spline. Mm -hmm. But we have a gear from 247 to 456 in every tenth. Back when we were running naturally aspirated, we got into a spot where we needed a gear that wasn't available because it was in between. We haven't gone to an event where we don't do one gear change. As you guys can see around us are four other engines, but let's talk about this, which I love that this is the street variant of this car. The OG, this is the original Lingenfelter motor that they put in the original car, basically a street car. This is with the one that went and ran La Carrera. This is the one, and wrecked. Larry, uh, God rest his soul, he just passed away a while back, our motor guy, forever. Mm -hmm. Larry went through this and Put a little different head on it, change the compression up a little bit. It's basically a Malacone motor now, it's not necessarily a Lingen filter, but it's an aluminum Donovan block with aluminum AFR heads on it. And the original motor was all painted orange. Dan's deal, when we showed up to the Silver State Classic with this motor, it was painted orange, the intake manifold was orange. We roll it out and he'd lift the hood and he said, ah, it's just a hopped up 427. Right, that was Dan's tip. Just a hopped up 427, right? 875 or 540. When this thing fired off in the trailer up there, everybody was like, what the yeah, hell's going on? Yeah, we're racing for a second. What does this make power wise right Eight, now? 875. 875. At the flywheel. Yeah, at the flywheel. Yeah. That's the street car. <laughs> yeah, that, that's our little motor. What's the transmission that connects on this one? This has got a G Force GSR, the standard four speed. It's basically the same trans NASCAR and the Xfinity and trucks all run. So is car. that is it's that not sequential? It's not. No, it's a it's H. an H pattern, yep. but is it a no lift shift? No. Is, I didn't know if it was like one of the what do they call them? Uh, the Jerichos? Basically. Do you clutch it? Well, at certain times you do and it's certain times you don't have to. This thing shifts. You ever ride a two-stroke motorcycle like a 500? Of course. You know how they shift? Deet, 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 yeah. deet, deet, deet. Same thing. This is bare bones. It is dry sump, right? This car is a dry sump. Yep. People say, oh, that's your dry sump tank. No, this is a water tank that runs off a pump and a solenoid to a spray bar to the radiator and oil cooler. One of the big issues at Pikes Peak is the higher you go, the thinner the air is, so the air over radiators aren't as effective. Dave went to work, came up with this system. It's computer controlled at a certain temperature. This thing will open a solenoid and it'll start spitting water at the radiator to cool it down. Got it, wow. What's this that Those I see coming Those are backing plates for our duck coolers when we're road racing. The fuel lines over here, which depending on what we're running, if we're running alcohol or, or race fuel, they run back and run through the rocker panel. Oil lines for the dry sump over here, they do the same thing to get into the trunk area. So you were saying with the front spoiler, you have different setups for that as well, yep. right? Depending yep. on what you yeah, guys are doing. Yeah, we've got different splitters that will go on it as well. Sure. Different spoilers with brake duct, no brake duct. Yeah. On our land speed, we have a block off grill that blocks this whole grill off because we run on alcohol, no radiator. The radiator comes out, all of this comes out. Really? The Pro Charger sits up through here and it's 
sheet metaled off and then we have a couple of big air horns that sit back here in this pocket. So you don't need the grill open to have airflow coming in? No. Nope. Because nope. of the alcohol, right? Yeah. And it's aero. Like, what's the braking setup on this car? Is that something else that changes given what... The only time the braking system will change on this car is when we go to Bonneville. We run 15-inch wheels at Bonneville, steel wheels, and it won't carry a 14-inch rotor. So we have a real small, bare brakes, solid rotor package. You don't even need brakes at Bonneville. If you use your brakes at Bonneville, you're already in trouble, and it's too late. Yeah. Other than that, we always run the big 14-inch rotor and a big six-piston bears. Manual setup? Yep, yep. Yeah. Bear brakes have, have been behind us on this car for a long time. There just is no other. Not like it's a friggin' surprise that you guys have support, but like I know Summit's all over the car. Summit, the Joe at Pro Torque, Carl at Rossler, Sergio at Pro Charger, Donnie at Holly. They all just stepped right up and said, what can we help you with? Yeah. What, you need help, here's my cell phone number. Yeah. Sunday morning, I don't care. Yeah. And this car is carbureted, right? It is today, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's got a big dominator on it. What are the wheels and the, the size? Those are BBS? <laughs> They're 18 inch BBS E88s, yep. 11 and a half and 12 and a half, and we'll run a 315 square uh, road racing, and then we'll run a three, 345 on the rear and a 315 up on the front and our straight line stuff. In fact, those are the tires that ran uh, the Silver State just the last time we ran it. Still the same tires on the car right now? Yeah, or? I drug them off the shelf and mounted them up so we were street legal. <laughs> Our goal is that he gets out of that car. When, when Dan built this car, he told Bill, I want that car to be able to be tumbled through the desert at the Silver State Classic and my boy to get out and dance on the roof. So it's a heavy pig. How much does it weigh? 3550. Okay. In, in, in this arrangement. In this setup, I get it. At Bonneville, we weighed 6200. Weight is your friend at Bonneville. It's traction. It's the same theory as driving on ice. The more weight you have on it, the more traction the you're going to get. The faster you're going to go. Yeah. So a little different than your asphalt mentality. Can Moving we, along. Can we pop the back? Because I want to see, I know something tells me this isn't a real luggage compartment going on. No, here. there's a little bit of magic that goes on back here. Wow, dude. Yeah, right? So Penske coilovers, these are reservoirs back here. 55-gallon mm -hmm. fuel cell put in this car for the Silver State Classic. So we'd be able to run 100 miles at 200 mile an hour. God, that's massive. Four gallon dry sump tank. Our fuel lines come back through the rocker. So this is for a fuel injected setup. When we run straight line, we have gas tanks that fit up in the front. Like where that one water tank is, mm -hmm. that'll get replaced with a, tank, a fuel tank. Oh like really? Nine gallons. This becomes water. This is our water tank. So we're on alcohol and it's only, we're only a mile and a half or five at Bonneville. At Bonneville, we have twin tanks we put up there. This so just becomes, enough to get you the five miles, yeah, basically. Yeah, right? When we make a change on this car, the first thing I do is, what does it affect? You, and you predict all the problems that we that's We don't predict, cause. but we try to beat out every single one of sure, them. Sure, man. Right? We'll sure. sit over here and straighten bent nails. Sure. Trying to figure out, sure. if we do this, what does it do? Anything that goes on in this car has been absolutely beat to death. Yeah. Aircraft, race cars, there's got to be redundancy. You've got to... For one, you gotta deal with what happens if something happens, the guy, you want the guy getting out of the car, like you said that, earlier. That, that's rule number one. And all the fail safes from the front all the way to the back, everywhere in between. And the fire system in the car, which we dip into that real quick. Originally we had DJ fire on the car. So when the car burnt, we didn't have enough. That's neither here nor there, that's nobody's fault. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. what it was, mm -hmm. and we learned. I came back and I sat down and I went to work and I started calling people, right? And I ran across Donnie at Fire Bottle. So back up underneath here, there's a little head. At 190 degrees, that head opens and it automatically dispenses its agent. I have one installed in the driver compartment and one in the engine compartment off of two separate 10 pound bottles. At 170 in the car, the car goes off, 190 in the cell and 230 under the hood. Got it. And it also has pulls, right, which will activate on just the Right, pole. but like you said, if he's incapacitated, yeah. you, you don't so, want to rely uh, on Again, him. how do we get the driver out of the car yep. at all costs? Yep. The body is modified, right? It's been pulled. We had a slip up in Birmingham when we were with Chevrolet testing the 2014 against Big Red, and he slipped off the racetrack on a wet track and bent the left front fender. And we went out to a guy out here in the desert, Alano, that had every Camaro part with still factory ta tags, right? Out in containers in the middle of nowhere. And bought a fender and bolted it on. We do some work up in the upper fender. We put some shields up in there to keep rock pits from blasting the paint out. And 
we'll pull them out and roll the fender a bit, but it hasn't been completely cut up and channeled and widened or uh -huh. anything like that. Uh -huh. They've just been pulled a tad. Uh -huh. Where does the exhaust dump out, by the way? Um, right now, it dumps out right in front of the rear axle. Okay. It just comes straight back off the collectors and dumps. So it's not straight pipe, though. It's, or it's pretty there, close There to are it. Barola mufflers on it. At some point, a fellow Chris Kaufman worked for Barola that was friends with Dan and, and the family, and he showed up at the shop with some Barola mufflers. So we put Barolas on it. Well, we showed up at the event and fired the car up and Dan goes, car sounds funny. It doesn't sound like Big Red, get them off. Made it through the event, got back to the shop, took them off. Chris went back to Barola and Barola made shells. Since because, straight five. Yeah. <laughs> In our Pikes Peak setup, they actually come out of the collector and we have an H pipe and then they'll side exit right here. Got it. And in our Procharge setup, they're big giant oval potato guns. And again, Dave's theory was, why not use that 2000 horsepower of exhaust thrust, help you out. Every little thing, you know, has been just beat to death. Yeah, I get it, man. I always love interiors on cars. I gotta imagine this is pretty hollowed out, yeah? Completely. It's so funny, this will sound stupid to you, but I'm looking at it going, holy shit, this is just pure race car. Like, Wait till I, you I, try to get in it. I'm picturing myself bending into a pretzel to get in this thing, but I'm gonna do it. God, this cage is intense in here. So, so this probably hits on every back, possible rule you could back, ever well, come exa across. Exactly, on. you know, Bonneville and Land Speed Racing, they're their own animal. And then Pikes Peak had a pretty stringent, their, their rules and their requirements for cage was pretty over the top, yeah. understandably. When it, the decision was made, we're gonna do Pikes Peak and we're gonna to totally restore the car before we do it. There were some bars cut and some bars changed. There were some that were cut out and increased. But for yeah. the most part, it is the original cage. Are these Kirky seats? They are. They're actually billet Kirky seats oh, that wow. they don't even produce anymore. Wow. I gotta say, I love seeing the stock. The factory dash. You, you see the air, the air conditioner controls? Yeah, 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 totally. Club box, the, ashtray, the steering wheel. Steering wheel. wheel. You guys gotta understand, we're trying to encapsulate something like 30 plus years into about 30 <coughs> minutes because we can't put together a 12 hour episode. <laughs> Why don't you walk me around the engines that were, this a couple is our, of them are doubles, right? Yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah. They're backups yeah. to one. We have a brother and a sister for everything. This is the bare bones of it right here. It's just a Brodex block, 565, 555 cubic inch, full roller, Carrillo rod, dry sump motor with a crank driven pro charger. This is your top speed car. This is our beast right here. We have this exact motor only in full cast iron for Bonneville. We had went to a cast iron motor up front to keep the balance in the car. Is, is that the biggest pro charger available or do no, they get it bigger th than this? They make three. They make one that you can put a baseball in, one you can put a softball in, and one you can wear for a hat. <laughs> and this is a softball. So when, when so, this thing's in the car, what do you make power-wise with this car? Uh, anywhere from 14 to 2,000. And it's on a blow-through carburetor setup. In Classic that we run in Bonneville, no electronic engine management, no timing retard, no nothing. You can gather all the information, but you can't, the computer can't tell the motor to do nothing, so it's full mechanical. We have an injection setup in here that works off a barrel valve on the carburetor. These individual ports are jetted. Our distributor back here was originally a vacuum advanced distributor that Dave took and basically turned around and built this contraption back here that works off of boost retard. So as the car starts coming up on boost, it will start pulling timing out and pulling timing out. To change boost in this thing, it's got a gear case up here in between the procharger and the crankshaft that just uses a quick change, like a quick change rear end gear. Sure. Quick so change gears change in the here. Gearing and that's just, just change it. Yeah, that's I, it. I, 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 <laughs> About two hours, we can we can do a gear change. But that's what so that's what's going to give you the ability to go from the fourteen hundred to correct. the two thousand yep, setup. Yep, correct. And, and we and we try to got keep it. this thing running around twenty pounds, twenty two pounds of boost, because it takes five of us ten hours at the racetrack to change a motor. We'll hurt one, right? And everybody go, oh yay, we got a chance. Big red blew up, right? No. And, they'll, and they'll roll in in the morning, and we'll all be wiping grease off our forehead with the thing warming up, and they'll be like. You gotta be kidding me. We're screwed. Yeah, and we just go back out and spank them again. 
This is our fuel injected 555 road racing motor. This is what you would be running at like the, Pikes Peak? We ran this exact motor at Pikes Peak mm -hmm. and all last year road racing. Fuel injected, probably 12, 13 to one compression, running on C25 fuel, dry sump, throttle bodied EFI, computer controlled, crank triggered. We and run this one a, makes what? A thousand and all day long. That motor delivered with this one. I picked them both up together, and that one's never been in the car. And so that's a fresh, ready to go. It's ready. So that's how bulletproof this has been. Yeah. Wow. And him, he hasn't found neutral. Plus you don't his want heart. Him to find neutral. Yeah, man. no, neutral's no fun. But we, you know, when we went and ran Pikes Peak, we we never missed a minute on the racetrack, which was brutal for a rookie. The rookie needs every second he can get on the mountain, and we we were flawless. We run a front-mounted alternator on the, on the road racing setup. In all our land speed stuff, we'll drive it off the rear end. We run a, a Tilton five and a half inch triple disc clutch on this deal with the reverse starter. This stuff gets conventional starter. It's got a McLeod double disc in it right now just for drivability on the street. Yeah, 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 on yeah. The so it's not an on-off clutch yeah, kind of setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And we, yeah. We don't, we're not killing a thousand dollar clutch. For Getting deal. stuck in traffic for yeah. a second, yeah. That girl over there is the 598. She's, that's the torque monster. I can't believe we're gonna go street drive. Can you go for a ride? Look, I, I'm seriously, I'm getting emotional. That's how, that's how, I know you guys work around this every day. For me, this is a seriously big deal. This Do you is, know how many times I've ridden in this car under power? None. Seriously? None. We're gonna put cameras in the car. I'm gonna jump in with RJ and we're gonna go for a drive around the neighborhood out here, man.
little bit, not too bad actually. Yeah. It's just a little odd, you know. Yeah. And I'm so unprepared, I feel like. You know what I, mean? I keep saying to myself, where's all my stuff? You know, like, what yeah, am I doing? Yeah. Where's my helmet? My yeah, house? where's my helmet? All right, you guys, so that's what it's like getting a ride in Big Red Camaro on the streets. I still can't believe that just happened. Seriously, I, uh, dude, thank you. Yeah, I had a great time. I mean, as, as I say, you know, we're always racing in this car, and we're usually at events on tracks, yeah. and it's rare that I just get to take it out on the street and ride around <laughs> with other traffic and people, like, waving at me and going, what the hell is that thing coming down the street? It's a freak show going down the I, road. I, I think I, we uh, I, picked up some attention. I think, I think Victor Vildo is your street <laughs> driving big red Camaro. So you guys are going to leave you with a big thanks for hanging and watching what we do. And uh, I'll, I'll see you in the next episode. I can't even talk right now. I'll see you guys in the next episode. All right, man. Bye.